A lot of people watching on the web right now, I assume. Uh, well, I if they raise their hand when they I'm say no. that. Everyone on the web, can you raise your hand, please? <laughs> <laughs> There's no app for that, apparently. Around the world, they're watching us right now. That's right. Yes. I think we still have... Oh, they have turned off the music, too. Mm. That must be ready to start. Talk Hi, to guys them. and gals. <laughs> ah. Well, thank you all so much for making it out to the opening of the Art of Video Games exhibition here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. This is the very first time that video games have been featured as the subject of art in this museum, so this is pretty historical. So you guys are part of this history. So again, thanks for coming out. <laughs> All right, now that's, that's our new motto. Yesterday we were the future, today we're history. That's right. <laughs> and speaking of history. <laughs> So allow me to introduce uh, the panel we have up here. You guys are in for an, an amazing treat. You know, one of the things we get to talk about all the time is that working with video games, working with game developers, we get to see a lot of each other at conferences that we go to. But by and large, you know, we never really get to talk to, you know, people who don't get to go to those conferences that might maybe want to get into the video games industry or understand how they can bring the stories that they want to tell to the world. And so we have two panels today. The first one is going to be a panel about the evolution of video games. We're going to be talking to some of the pioneers and some of the people who are helping to keep this, this stuff alive. Um, and with that, I'll start some introductions. So uh, my name is Chris Melisinos. I'm the, cura the guest curator for the art of video games. Thank you. There's the man. Thank you. Authored the book, The Art of Video Game, in the gift shop right now. That's right. Available at <laughs> fine museum, gift stores, yes. right upstairs. And no. for you people watching on the web, you can come to the Intellivision Lives website and buy it from our store. Shilling. That's right. Okay. Shilling. That is the last of the commercial promotion because we are in the Smithsonian. And so we are going to... Yes, I was we're going to a federal crime to sell anything here other than what they have in the gift shops. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Directly to my left is Mike Micah. He is the chief creative officer for Other Ocean Interactive and formerly studio head for Backbone Entertainment at Foundation 9. He has contributed to more than 100 games as an engineer, animator, and writer. Oh, that sounds good. There you are, look at that. <laughs> well, when I met you, you were the one journalism. Yes. Electronic gaming. Yes, that's right. Directly to his left is Keith Robinson, who has worked for Mattel Electronics as a programmer designing the game Tron Solar Sailor. Woohoo! <laughs> no, 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 and no. supervising production for Intellivision, ColecoVision, and other platforms, including Intellivision Lives, so I believe you are the, uh, the rights holder, the owner yes. of the collective body of work that is in television games. I control in television. That's right. Today in television, in tomorrow in the world. Minds, in all of your minds. Uh, next thing we have Rand Miller, who is the co-founder and CEO of Cyan, which is now Cyan Worlds. And he catapulted to fame with the unexpected success of the computer game Myst. Yeah. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have Don Daglo, who is the president and creative director of Daglo Entertainment, is the only executive in industry history to lead development teams on every generation of video game consoles, and has won an Emmy Award for technology and engineering for his creation of Neverwinter Nights. Wow. All right, he guys. He interviewed me at Mattel. You know, maybe we should, maybe that's, you know what, Keith, that is a perfect place to start. This <laughs> so, I remember, I I'm remember Kong when I, when, it, when I first got a hold of this thing, right? Yeah. I remember, you know, the first games that came into the house when I was a kid. I was born in 1970, and this kind of thing came into the house. I God. remember the television that we had, I know, just a young guy, right? Baby. I remember the television that we had, um, could never have, I like, vertical holds correctly, mm -hmm. so you used to have to... You know, hit it mm -hmm. a couple of times. <laughs> yep. Which is different than your kids trying to hit your flat screen TV thinking <laughs> that it's a touch screen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that. <laughs> and you know, I, I just remember being completely captivated by the fact that something was happening inside of the machine that um, 
I couldn't touch, I, it didn't exist in the real world, but I could control it. You know, there was something that was happening beyond the glass. Um, you know, growing up with, in television, growing up with Atari, these were the sorts of experiences that we were, we, we wanted to be a part of, uh, had a very difficult time as kids articulating why they were so important to us. So, you know, maybe, you know, we'll start with Keith, and you could talk a bit about, you know, what was the world like with video games? <laughs> Or back way in those days. back, way we back. To, <laughs> okay, Grandpa's going to tell the, the story here. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, so I, I want you to really talk about, yeah. you know, frame, well, frame the, the well, no, yeah. hold on a second, frame the discussion of computers and video games in the world. Mm -hmm. Who was just discovering what computers yeah. actually were? Right. Well, I, I hear this all the time from people that, you know, the video game, the television, the Atari, whatever, was the first time the, these people ever interacted with a computer. You didn't have ATMs. You didn't have voicemail. Well, I guess we had ATMs about then, but but about the same time. And some people were still afraid of them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, you, know, you didn't have the voicemail where you push this button, push that button. So all these things which now are part of life, for a lot of people started there. And I get, I get uh, letters all the time from people who say, I work at NASA, I work on the Mars program. And the first time I ever got interested in computers or anything or science was playing my Intellivision. And I say, no refunds. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I am not going to be responsible for your career choices. but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that, that, like I say, it, that was the thing, the fun thing about uh, designing the games back then is that we grew up in a time when there was no such thing as interactive games. And so you know, a lot of us have played board games or whatever, but that element of time which you can put into a game, you know, there's a real timer there, and that's really what you have is this interaction with the timer in there. Um, we, we were making it all up, you know, and, and at Mattel, yeah, this guy interviewed me at Mattel Electronics. <laughs> yeah, I should have mentioned they both work together. So. Yes. But um, there was a thing called the Minkoff measure. And that was, and it was a little measure, it was a little test. We weren't allowed legally to call it a test. But uh, Mike Minkoff, who was your counterpart, other director, there were two directors there. He was one, Mike was the other one. But um, in, in early hiring, it was like, well, you can't go and hire, at that time, you couldn't like advertise for a video game designer. There was no such thing. And they, the first couple of people they hired, there was one of them that uh, turned out to be a real disappointment, programming-wise. So Mike created that specifically. So you know, we need a standard so we can judge people on it. Mm -hmm. So he he pulled out this little part of uh, one of a real program, and that became the Minkoff measure, mm -hmm. where you just had to look at it and then describe what's it doing. You know, to that end, you know, we're talking about limitations mm -hmm. of not only technology, but the way to describe what it is that you were trying to build, mm -hmm. right? Don, you actually have a, a great way of framing that discussion of, you know, the, the works that you want to bring out through video games, but what the technology limited in terms of what you could do. Maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, I think because just as context, when I started writing games, we had text and that was it. And would print on paper. We didn't have screens yet. <laughs> we got screens in the mid 70s. So when I first encountered the computer, you would hear, if you were outside the room, you would hear this clackety clack, 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 and you'd go in, and you would see an old teletype machine. It was the way they used to deliver news to newspapers from the news services. And it would print on paper, if there's the kind of paper you would normally write a letter on, and there is toilet tissue. And then you imagine what is halfway in between the two. <laughs> that is the paper that would come off of rolls that these machines would print on. And so, when we first encountered machines, these machines, it was all text. Mm -hmm. And I was a playwriting major at Pomona College, so for me, text was, oh, I know what to do with this. This is very comfortable. But so at that point, the idea of technology enabling us was very exciting. It was interactive. We could say, oh, wait, you can control what the computer says to the person based upon what the person typed into the computer? Oh, that's amazing technology. And then, of course, then we, got, we actually got CRTs. Uh, actual monitors. Oh wow, we can actually refresh it. We don't have to waste all this paper. I once had a baseball game that had a bug in it and it ran to about a thousand innings and the stack of paper was this high <laughs> coming out. Hey Don, let me ask you, so. with that noise I clacked, was it like this Pavlovian response where you heard it, it's like an ice cream truck mm -hmm. bell <laughs> for kids. It's like, there's something happening in the game, and get it to the paper. You know, the first, what was funny was the first time I heard it, it was curiosity that drew me into the room where the terminal was. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was, a, it was a bad thing because if you walked up and you heard the clackety clack, it meant somebody else was on the terminal and you had to wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, you wanted silence as you walked up to the room. But then as we got, when the industry began, and I was lucky, as Keith's saying, I was really lucky 
as one of the original five in-house and television programmers. I was born at the right time, showed up at the right time. They did not believe that I had been writing games for nine years because they didn't know about the university underground. And so after, eventually I convinced them I wasn't lying, so I still got hired. But <laughs> then we had graphics of a certain, of, of a certain resolution. Then it, graphic resolution grew and grew and grew. And now we're to the point where we can create images that feel very much like a movie. So at each moment, if you look backwards, it feels like, oh, we're so restricted in what we can do. And we always used to say, oh, well, you know, if we had more than 16 colors, we could challenge Michelangelo <laughs> but with these restrictions. But it's interesting because, yes, you felt the sense of restriction and, and so on. But honestly, we were excited. Each generation of hardware, we got each change each way that something grew. We talked about how at the beginning you had the entire world, but then you had to figure out how you could shrink it down and express your view of a world just on a postage stamp. But then the postage stamp starts to get bigger and bigger until now it can be the size of a room. So, so you know, can I point out one thing there? Sure. Is one of the resources, talking about the resource, what you can do, is um, the game I worked on was a game on the IntelliVoice. It talks. In television, it talks. This B-17 is right. Marmer. Yeah. And, we, <laughs> and we would write scripts that had all this interaction. It would be great. Then when you actually had to do it, you have room for like about 20 words or something like that. Because these games, my game was 16K, and that was generous. The first voice game was Space, Space Bartons was 12K. And, uh, That's smaller than the average email. Right yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Utopia was 4K. 4K. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, all, by, the, by, all the early games were well, actually, 4K. It, by comparison, the, the icon for Firefox on OS X is 64K. <laughs> 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 and if you think I'm lying, go check the, uh, the, the info file on that. You'll so we had to do a lot of cool. tricks to make things work. <laughs> right. So, but, you know, Rand, maybe you could talk a bit about, you know, we're talking about technological limitations, um, imposing restrictions on the stories that you want to tell. Mist did something um, at you know, its point of release that not only kind of captured the imagination of people who were trying to figure out they were appropriating faster and bigger computers into the home. CD-ROM technology all of a sudden became accessible and trying to figure out how, what it meant uh, to computers, to you know, the evolution of this. You guys were very uh, able to harness this successfully, but there were still limitations you had to work within. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the limitations were, uh, well, uh, MIST was the right thing at the right time for us, which I, I'll bet all of us can relate to that. I mean, we just happened to get the right limitations, put everything together at the right time for the right stuff. And MIST was, MIST was interesting because we were at a time where it, it seems to everybody that MIST just came out of nowhere and was this huge success. And, but we had been building these worlds out of the technology for a lot of years. It uh, wasn't an overnight success. We ate a lot of beans and rice <laughs> before that. And, um, in fact, even with Mist, we weren't sure how we were going to put it together. Mist is different because Mist was uh, Bless you. At, at the at the point in time where people are using technology to deliver more and more sophisticated, uh, dynamic games. We were using the technology to kind of pre-compute the uh, a, a little different experience, and so we used the technology in a, in a bit of a different way. But it was dramatic because it looked so different than than what could be uh, supplied dynamically, and, and it was the right thing at the right time because it, uh, we also knew that CD-ROM was a little bit slow, so our worlds had to be a little bit smaller. We had to segment them, so we made ages, and uh, we weren't sure how that would be delivered. Anyway, all, the, all the, the, uh, the actual limitations of the technology, and you, everybody will agree with this, contribute to your game design, and if they don't, you're hosed because it's not going to work. Uh, <laughs> So those limitations, that box that you talked about, those things actually, you live with those, and it's this great back and forth, well, what's the limitation? Let's do this, do this. Are we still within the limitations? What about art? What about voice? Boom, boom, and it all builds, and it all kind of keeps contained in there, and if, you, if you've done everything magically, you get something that works at the end after you beat it with a stick for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, in, in walking people through the, uh, the five playables, and we stop and look at Mist, what I... It, try to explain to them is there's a point you and I were discussing where you step into the elevator and 
you get in and you turn around and you press the button to shut the door. And after you've activated the elevator, you're presented with this beautiful still image and these four bars. And you can see this sliver of motion in between the gaps of the bars. Because the technology was not sufficient at the time to do full motion anime, you know, full screen animation of that kind of exactly. you know, pre-rendered movies. And so yeah. you were actually able to take the limitations inform that with your artistic path and actually use that to still create the experience you want. Yeah, in fact, when we started, um, we didn't really have video capability. Um, and it was during the process, and we were kind of looking forward. The quick time was this Apple technology that you know, everybody loved, and we thought that'll, that'll come out. And they gave us a you know, little postage stamp, literally. I mean, tiny little windows that you could do video in. And, but the design was such that we knew it would be small, and we designed with that. So little windows, and if you look at the books that open, the brothers are in little windows, and there's never open full. There's never doors that fully open and show full screen uh, animation till Riven, till Riven when we could do full screen stuff. Yeah. You know, one of the errors that um, that we classify in the exhibition is an error that I call transition. And what I think is wonderful, and it, I think it highlights some of the limitations that you ran into in designing MIST is that any time we are moving forward with technology that is not familiar to artists that have spent years working within a particular medium, you know, it's as if telling somebody who's ever only painted on canvas with oil, mm -hmm. fantastic. Now your next thing should be sculpted out of marble with this <laughs> chisel and hammer and how do we do these things? And so in some games, you can actually, you can almost see what the artist was trying to do because it is an amalgam of things that don't fully work <laughs> by themselves but together create a different experience than what was previously available, mm -hmm. right? Now, Mike, you've spent a lot of time uh, earlier on in your game development career looking at classic games and bringing them to more modern platforms. Yeah. Um, Mike and I have had many discussions about well, you know, do you want this signal in the line because it added to, you know, the noise on the screen and mm -hmm. how pure do you have to be and could we do it in filters? Talk a bit about the, the issues and the approach that you've taken to bringing classic games and porting them to more modern platforms, start trying to stay true to their original intent. Absolutely. The, um, you know, early on when I got into games, uh, for me it was a passion. Uh, I, I grew up playing these guys' games and they're, they're <laughs> heroes of mine. I, I went into games journalism. I remember when Myst came through our door and it was quite a debate because people were like, what is this? And we know it was beautiful and it was amazing, but it was also developed, talk about limitations, it was developed in HyperCard, oh, yeah. a language that people weren't developing games in. And um, my, my entry into gaming, I, I started to, as a, as a fan of these old games, I wanted to bring some of these games back and make sure that generations later were able to play them as they were intended. Um, and one of the best examples I, I've given is uh, you can play a game like Kaboom by Activision on the Atari 2600 and you, need, you had to have a paddle controller. And the game was so visceral, and it's such an intense, oh, yeah. great like a game. Zen. It's yeah. a zen moment. Mm -hmm. And Warlords as well by Atari. Yeah. These are incredible games that when you play with those controllers, even today modern game players, when they play them, they can't believe how incredible these games are. However, uh, people were re-releasing re these games uh, with joysticks or D-pads <laughs> and uh, with controls that were not intended for the game. And people were baffled, like, why do people like this game? Or it just wasn't the right experience. It yeah. didn't feel right, and it wasn't, you didn't have that visceral experience you had when you played the original. And so I, early in my career, I set out to try to recreate those experiences in these games or find a way to capture not just the game and how it looked, like the pixels and everything like that, but the, the nostalgic experience you had around it. And oftentimes, there's like music associated with what you had, your, what things you're doing with your friends were the outside experience that you brought to the game. So um, games like Street Fighter and these things that I've been fortunate enough to work on, uh, we've made sure that we replicate that experience down to the hum of the monitor or the way that uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, when you had a composite monitor, these old TVs, uh, you didn't see the squares per se. In fact, artists were actually trying to design images to blur between pixels to make it look mm -hmm. like there there's more color <laughs> or um, to smooth out edges around. Like I remember putting, I, I used D-Paint, a favorite tool of mine for a lot of my <laughs> games, but you would sit there and painstakingly every pixel, try to figure out how to make it look like it was a soft edge or the curve, curvature of a muscle or one of these things. Um, so it's, it's more about, to me, Make sure that the, the artwork and the way it was these games, I call them artwork now because I'm at the Smithsonian, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that we capture that, that, that as it was intended. Because that image, that people will send images over, and I notice like 
Chris, I got to talk to you about the aspect ratio on some of those things in there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but even the aspect ratio is a little bit off in, in representation of some of these older games, and, and that, that makes everything look squished or things are, are fatter looking, that sort of thing. And sometimes people know there's something a little bit off. So I've spent a lot of time and a lot of the games I've worked on recreating all that and making sure that these things are represented correctly. Um, and it is, it's pretty mind boggling to see the difference. Uh, NTSC red bleed, I'll throw this out there really quick. Mm -hmm. uh, red on an NTSC screen bleeds very easily. Games were, artwork was developed with that in mind, and they, mm -hmm. they would use that to create images and the way things would move and animate. Um, you just don't see that on emulation and stuff right. like today. So I spent a lot of time making sure that emulation we've developed and think replicates that. Yeah, that was something Connie Goldman, who was an yep. artist who worked for Dawn at Mattel, she was really good at that, you know, because you had 8 by 16 for a character, and you wanted a recognizable character, and you'd have to combine two of these of different colors. She only had one color. But she, she took advantage of that, that this color's going to bleed to that. Yeah, and animation-wise, too, I remember there was, there's two moments in gaming that I remember seeing a character run that was, like, amazing to me. The Intellivision guy, we always call him, because the, the run cycle was so smooth and so organic. <laughs> and Pitfall, Pitfall Harry and Pitfall, right. really amazing run cycles with yeah. eight pixels wide. Or, yeah. or, yeah. And when I was that young, I thought that was intentional. Like, the, the graphics being really simple. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just an art style. I didn't realize that was like <laughs> pixel limitations or Today you only had 160 <laughs> pixels across or whatever. It's so become an me, art I style. Would, I would draw pictures as a kid in pixels, really blocky right. pixels, because like, that's what everybody does. This is how beautiful exactly. it looks. I mean, my TV, <laughs> exactly. It's like my TV shows real people. Obviously, this thing yeah. can do it. I don't know what these guys right. are trying to do. Yeah, this here, looks better than TV. <laughs> but to, to add one of, the, one of the reasons I got into doing this again and bringing back these games was there was a, a game designer who uh, passed away, and she had done a lot of the educational games and stuff back in the early 80s. And uh, um, Ernest Adams spoke at her funeral and said, one of the sad things is, you can't play her games anymore. The platforms are all dead. Yep. So she has died, but also all of her games have died. It's like, no, we're bringing them back. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we don't want these games to be dead. Yep. So you know, we're talking <laughs> about the limitations of technology. Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to talk a bit about the progression of technology. So in moving from the Atari VCS to the Intellivision, and ColecoVision you know, slid into that same era, what did the additional capabilities of the Intellivision give you over what was, you know, kind of took the world by storm at first blush, which was the Atari VCS? What right. did the technology actually afford you as a game designer, as somebody who was trying to create an experience? Right. Well, I don't know if you agree with this, but um, the, with the Intellivision and the advance from the, the Atari, I don't think it was the hardware so much. I mean, obviously we had you know, a graphics chip that could resolve more and put more objects. We didn't have the flicker when you put two objects and three objects on the same line. But um, I think the software, because the Intellivision had an operating system in it and routines that the programmer could use. And I think that helped <laughs> develop stuff. Because you had a lot of it, the work already done for you. So you could come in and design stuff and not have to worry too much about reinventing everything each time. But and new so, genres came out of that, too. Yeah. Because uh, before, I, I'd known Don Daglow for a little while. I didn't realize he had made Utopia <laughs> for television <laughs> until yeah. Keith told me. <laughs> and uh, that was a game that I'd, I'd not seen that genre before right. on a game. So I, had, I was playing Atari and playing Space Invaders. And, uh, right. Yeah, we, we always actually, say Don invented it. Yeah, actually, no, so. th this, is a, this is a great game. So Utopia is probably the very first kind of god or simulation mm -hmm. game that was really experienced uh, by the American public on a home machine. And Don actually has an excellent story as to how Utopia really came into being. So I'd love for you to share that, Don. <laughs> well, when I, when I came out of college, there was no video game business. And we thought we were just doing, we had to sneak around at night to write games on the terminals at the computer center. Because if you're caught during, doing games during the day, well, you were interfering with serious computing and you would be kicked off the system. So amongst other things, I got a job as the system operator on the computer. So I was the one guarding the system from the evil game. <laughs> so I would sit here and operate the main console. And then over here was another terminal where I was actually working on Star Trek and baseball. But the, um, right, does everyone know that, that Don was the one who created the first Star Trek? Uh, it was right? an early Star Trek. There were actually Star Treks before mine. So mine was not the first. It was the first good one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you told him. <laughs> Where's my $10? There you go. <laughs> but the, uh, 
you know, I think in the, in the context of the time, I'm going back, I started thinking about that, and I thought about sneaking around, and I forgot that your question. <laughs> I, feel, well, I was thinking about, and, oh, yeah, we go in this Create a utopia. So we go through this about, entrance. Yeah, that's right. Talk utopia. to us how utopia came to be. Yes. So what I was doing to make a living after I got out of school, when I wasn't sneaking around inside academic buildings, um, the good news was I got to keep my computer access because I went to grad school at the same uh, complex. It's the Claremont Colleges in Southern California. So I went from Pomona College to Claremont Graduate University, and then I got hired as faculty at the Graduate University, so I ended up keeping my computer access for nine years so I could keep writing games. <laughs> but to make a living, I was a teacher, and I taught middle school social studies in a barrio called Cucamonga in Southern California with wonderful kids for six years. And so one of the challenges I saw there was a lot of those kids were raised in environments where there weren't a lot of books in the home, and so they didn't do a lot of reading. And many of them had not seen much of the world, but some of them had seen maybe 16 to 24 square blocks is where they had spent most of their lives, because they're very urban neighborhoods. And so you start talking about France and Germany and Japan and China, it's a very abstract concept. So we were struggling with this, and one day I got an idea and as a game designer, I noticed the cafeteria floor with its linoleum squares was a perfect grid. So I went to the hardware store and I bought three rolls of electrical tape. And I got my map, which of course has grids on it. And I recreated the world map on the cafeteria floor without asking the principal first, unfortunately. <laughs> now, and, and how big was this? This was, this, it was it, I, I, I scaled it so it uh, covered the entire, exactly the cafeteria floor, so you figure I don't know, probably 75 feet wide, I don't know, 100 feet wide, whatever was the size of the cafeteria. Um, Julian Lopez, thank you for not getting me in trouble for doing that. But the, um, and so then I made up games where He's the kids would play the different right roles in different countries, acting that out. There was, we've got an old, at the uh, uh, Strong Museum up in Rochester, New York, they've got an, a copy of the old newspaper article showing our kids in the local newspaper playing on top of this electrical <laughs> tape map. So when I started it in television, coming from having been a teacher and thinking about, okay, we've got a bunch of great sports games, those are going on. We've got a bunch of great arcade style games, those are going on. How can I counter program that? How can I do something that's different? Well, we'd done lots of simulation type games on mainframes in the 70s. And I thought, well, we kind of had the map thing and I just started playing with it and Utopia grew out of my kids' old activities. Some of those kids are now my Facebook friends, which is cool. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, that activity combined with a game I wrote in the 70s uh, called The Killer Shrews, which was based on a very bad 1964 movie, all that plus, plus the idea of a cr created utopia. Right, so out of the need to, to educate, you know, I mean, television presented you a platform right. in which to go ahead and bring this experience out to a much wider audience. Yeah. Right. Can I make a point about this there. that also relates to limitations? Yeah, because then I want to speak to Okay, you. just real quickly. Now, one of the biggest limitations we had at Mattel was that Mattel Incorporated didn't know anything about computer. They knew, they knew 15 cent toys. They didn't know anything about $300 game systems. And so they didn't give us a big budget for hiring people. So we couldn't go out, you know, here we had, we were selling games based on computer stuff. We couldn't go out and hire people who had experience as computer programmers. So a lot of the people we hired were from all walks of life. And just like, like for example, Andy Sells, who had been the, played the piano bar at the uh, local Tony Roma's Ribs. <laughs> and his wife was pregnant, and he said, boy, I better get a real job. And somebody said, hey, go down to Control Data Institute and take a six-week computer course. And they came over to the job fair and said, hi, I'm a piano player who, took, who has six weeks of experience in <laughs> computers. And we said, well, that sounds good. Let's hire him. He'll be creative. You see, and so we anybody, had all this creativity. Right. Anybody right. in any era can make video games, yeah. guys. This is the point. You know, I wish I'd have known about that. I wouldn't have had to work at a bank for something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, listen. But that was the strength. The strength yeah. was we had a team of people who were not a tech group. It was a creative group. Yeah. And, and that was why I think Mattel had the advantage of so many different types of games and genres. But that's the point. We are, one of the points of this exhibition here mm -hmm. as well is, you know, the output mm -hmm. that is now upstairs mm -hmm. is not born out of some, you know, soulless, faceless computer. The, it route, its route to the rest of the world may traverse some of those paths, but it is the humanity, the stories, the right. people behind these experiences that 
it's very easy to overlook them. It's very easy to just walk briskly past them and dismiss them. And this is, you know, a, an extraordinary opportunity to take that time, to take a step back and, you know, like I say, peel back that veneer and understand what the intent was underneath. So Rand, to, when we're talking about technology progression, tell us how advancements in technology then informed Riven and its sequel. Yeah, Riven was awesome. <laughs> it was, uh, Mist was basically the, uh, did so well that it was like, here, buckets of money, do what you want. Uh, and we spent wasn't way it, too much time the, and money. Wasn't it the best-selling computer game of the 1990s? Uh, I like to, I like to think of Mist as the best-selling computer game of the last millennium. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It can't take that away right. from us. <laughs> uh, that's a thousand years. That's right. right. And uh, I know perfect timing. Is. Right. Perfect time. Uh, it's funny because I, we, I mean, just quickly. I mean, I got started playing Star Trek. I mean, that I, the first game I played was Lunar Lander on a text. Mm. You know, and mm -hmm. I was hooked. I mean, it was text. There wasn't there wasn't a, a rocket ship or a moon or a surface. It was. Here's how much fuel you have. Here's, mm -hmm. here's how fast you're going. Uh, here's how high you are. How much fuel you want to burn? Five. Return. <laughs> zit, 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 zit. <laughs> Rinse, repeat. Until you either crash, land, or, you know, that's it, I guess. Crash or land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and boy, Binary. was that awesome. <laughs> I mean, I, I never looked back. It, that was it. I was, I, I was on to the games, and mm -hmm. Star Trek was. Now you're talking about Star Trek on the timeshare machines, right? Yeah. Wow. I didn't know. I, I, mine was not the first of that. That's why I keep going back. Okay, was if yours was the good one, then yours is the one I liked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I'm sure that was the one. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've got a lot going forward. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're doing this in the little things, building worlds. I mean, the worlds were the things we were intrigued by, building these worlds instead of games. Boom, 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 boom. Mist hits big and provides us with buckets of money that because basically we did it ourselves, we pour it back in, and Riven was lush and beautiful. And so it was a perfect game. Not. Um, <laughs> it's not necessarily the buckets of money that make something yeah. great. It's, it's in some ways, which is exactly kind of turn around, it's the restrictions. And we didn't have as many restrictions. It took a long time. We tried to figure out everything perfectly from Mist, what we did wrong, what we did right, pour everything in. And I'll tell you, it is probably one of the most beautiful games. I mean, I, I really love Riven, but it's, you know, it's got some brutally hard spots and not, we, we tried to wrap the story in so deeply that some, some spots it feels not quite so, and I mean this in a good way, Disneyland-like of Mist, where there was a lot of activity packed in because, oh, there were no restraints. It's like the first season of Lost. We don't really know where this is going to go, but we'll just fill it up with everything. It'll be awesome. Um, Riven had to actually start making sense of all that. And so, you know, it, it, it was a little bit harder, not quite as interesting, but boy, the technology, having that technology at your fingertips started to be, feel, oh, that power, yeah. I mean, I remember the first time, you know, playing it and then seeing a full motion actor walk into this frame because yeah. Here I was expecting, all right, a better looking mist. Uh, <laughs> Just, you know, prettier pictures. And then all of a sudden this actor walked into the frame and saw me and then ditched out of frame and I was like, what the heck just happened there? <laughs> it was amazing. In fact, one of the things I was telling Rand before is I believed mist was one of the most um, claustrophobic and unnerving experiences. Now, let me tell you how hardcore I was in that. I played it on the 3DO, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Connected to a very rudimentary surround sound system on a 26-inch color television that my wife and I saved money when we first got married to go buy. <laughs> and I remember sitting alone in the dark playing this thing going, what was that noise? <laughs> oh, yeah. like, I do not want to be in this room right now. So thanks a lot, Rand. Um, so Mike, what I want to talk to you about real quick in, uh, is a game that you guys worked on uh, was called uh, Perfect Dark Zero. Dark Void Zero. Oh, Dark Void Zero, rather. But Not Perfect, Perfect Dark, Dark Zero, Zero which Not is Perfect Dark Zero. even scarier. You can pull the claps back. That's right, sorry. All right, sorry. <laughs> I've been up for a long time already. <laughs> so Dark Void Zero. Um, you and I have had many discussions about this, mm -hmm. but I think it's wonderful to, to share this with the folks here today because this is about taking modern technology but also keeping uh, kind of the art and the style and mechanics pure to the games you're trying to basically have to pay this homage to. So yeah. talk a bit about it. So... Uh, 
I was, I was at a game developers conference, and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who was at Capcom, and he was telling me about this big game they had coming up called Dark Void. And uh, I, this is a good point to be in your career when you're like, I've got money to spend, and I want to work on something kind of small and cool. And so I was telling him this, and he's like, well, you could do whatever you want with Dark Void. Like, we, we're, we're going to launch this game, but we don't have anything on these platforms. And I was really into the Nintendo DS, which a lot of people were kind of like dismissing or whatever, but I'm like, I love the DS. Thank you. Thank yes, you. <laughs> And uh, so we thought, what if we actually do, it was near April Fool's, and we're like, it'd be kind of cool to go out there and say, there's a game that Capcom was working on in 1988, and they didn't finish it, and it inspired this new Dark Void game. And so we came up with the concept of Dark Void Zero, and it, was just, it happened really quick, because I'm like, I want to work on a Nintendo game, and I didn't get a chance to work on Nintendo in my career, so I want to do that. So let's build a game with all the same limitations, let's capture all the nostalgia of that, and, uh, and put it out there and just pretend this game exists in 1988, and fool everybody. So that night, I, I'd been drinking that day. Uh, <laughs> that night, I had hit Wikipedia, and I started changing entries everywhere. And putting this game <laughs> on every set I could find, everything like that, and just like... Well, that's where that came from about me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're the one. I am. <laughs> you saw those? Uh, no, the, uh, so we put all, those, uh, all these things in there, and, like, uh, and we announced the game maybe three or four weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put up some like, screenshots and stuff like that, and uh, people were suddenly like, experts on Dark Void Zero. Like, I played that uh, when I was young. <laughs> And they're, and they're they're all hitting Wikipedia and going like, of course it was on Play Choice Ten and all this stuff, <laughs> and uh, it, it started to work. And then I knew that if we had to sell that even more to really like build people up in the fiction of this, I need to get somebody who's a little more famous, but maybe not back then. So uh, we've been working with uh, Jimmy Fallon from Late Night with Jimmy Fallon on some stuff, and we talked over the years. And like, mm -hmm. he was a huge NES fan. So I said, what if we can say you won this contest to go to Japan to be in a game that Capcom's making, but then it got canceled. He loved it, and so he had his dad send pictures of him from 1988 so we could Photoshop him into marketing materials. <laughs> <laughs> and he even went on national television and told us that he right. told all of America that he did this thing for huh. us. And uh, so by the time we launched and, and people downloaded this game, it was actually a love letter to NES games and, and the visuals and the, the audio of NES. Bear McCreary, who did our audio for the game, he is an Emmy-winning, I believe an Emmy-winning, he's a huge television and film um, composer, uh, did it for free. Sorry, Bear. Uh, free you did, sorry, that was great. Um, but he did this composition by actually wiring up an NES and doing it authentically. Like he created all the music as, as an NES would have it. And our artists created everything in the limitations of an NES, the 52 color palette, mm. and even the, the way that the sprites are displayed in the game, with all stuff. But one of the biggest things that captured everybody's imagination, and this goes back to, I think, is why nostalgia and what was happening at the time is important. Okay, I know you what you're could, gonna say, but... Uh, I'll let you say it. No, no, I'm not gonna say it, but I will <laughs> tell you, that when this happened, Mike's in California, I'm on the East Coast, so I must have called him at about seven in the morning <laughs> and went, I cannot believe you just did this because I look like an absolute fool doing it. So now he'll tell you what he actually it did. It was seven in the morning, I was really tired. The, uh, <laughs> we, we had the game start up, and uh, if you remember playing NES, you probably remember the... Cartridge. Yes. I and the, that. I love <laughs> the screen would flash, and you're like, oh, it's not working. You would pull the cartridge out, blow on it, <laughs> and put it back in and hope that that would turn on. And more often than not, it would. So at the beginning of this game on DS, you fire it up, the screen starts flashing. People instinctively, we got so many letters about this, would instinctively just blow on the DS. <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> it was awesome. It was <laughs> and we, we would listen to the microphone and wait for distortion, and that would activate the game. So like, they would blow, and the game would start. Uh, it was like, it, yeah, it the problem it. was, I was in a doctor's office waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh, let me download Mike's newest game. I can't wait to play it. And it started flashing. But oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but that's how important it is. It's like a time, a time of life and what people remember about like, the, the hardware itself. And you have to capture that when you bring these games back. Right. And so, you know, again, it's not about the, the massive expanse of technology, comparatively speaking. It's about making sure that you are limiting your artistic intent, yep. the intent of what it is you want to say, the things that you pull in that are either present in society or present within the framework of the game you're creating and yeah. work to that. So technology, you know, again, is just a tool by which we use to create story, to create, like any artist in any medium, right? We have tools at our disposal in which to do these things. So I think it's fascinating that, you know, in the earliest era of video games in the United States, we'd have to look at supplemental materials that would be shipped along with these classic right. games because the square in the screen with an arrow is this warrior mm -hmm. on an epic quest, and the only reason you know this is because you read 
15 pages of this book that accompanied the, the yeah. product. Well, when I started at Mattel, designing a game meant they gave us grid paper, and you designed it on the grid paper, and then you said, okay, and you did a hexadecimal number that, uh, you know, you have essentially ones and zeros of the grid filled in, and so you figure out what the binary of that is, and you figure out the hexadecimal, and you enter it that way, and so it was all designed on paper. And then the programmers just kind of went, we're going nuts here. And so the development tools that we had to, to develop artwork was actually done by Eric Wells, who was one of the um, uh, artists who worked for you. And, but he spent most of his time developing the system so that all of us could, uh, could design stuff on screen. You know, could actually use the Intellivision as a tool to develop Intellivision games. That's fantastic. It, it's, it's funny, I mean, it, it, it's as if every time there's a new technology, the tools are not available right. and, the, and the development process gets rougher with that new technology for a while. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you did, uh, you know, Star Trek in basic. It was pretty lush. I mean, you know, not too bad. But then by the time the home computers came out, I've got 64 dots by 64 dots. And I'm, I mean, the ones you build yourself, mm -hmm. you know, the, and, and I'm flipping ones and zeros on the, on the front right. of the thing. And then and we do that even now. I mean, now we've got when the internet came out, then suddenly the tools get rough yeah. again. I mean, even you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, wait, I've got to do this stuff again, yeah. and now we're to mobile platforms. Like, wait, I've got to fit it in that much space again, and it seems to go a little backward, which is not a bad thing, I guess, if you have these skills. You can, you know, maybe somebody needs them again someday. And in fact, <laughs> one of the cycles we see is with each new wave of hardware that comes out, you can actually watch this if you go back and watch the games, because the first games on any platform, any system, and this even includes Internet Now Mobile. Mm -hmm. The first games that get done, we're just kind of, it's like going into a room where you know it's a living room, but the lights are out. So you know there's a sofa, and there's a chair, and there's a TV somewhere. But there's no lights, and you're feeling your way around the room for it. And so you still have a deadline. The game still has to ship. And you're trying to figure out, OK, how am I going to get something out here? And you're just learning the system. Then after you finish your first game, now you're cocky, and you're, oh, I, I really know the system. I, I, I can do anything with this platform now. I mean, it just, it just the power flows from my hands into the, into the machine. And then you finish the second game, and you go, oh, how little I knew. <laughs> how little I knew, but I now, now I am master of all. I survey, because now. And then just at the point where you go, now I really can do it. Now I'm ready to create a masterwork. That hardware is now out. <laughs> And you're back groping for the sofa right. and the chair yeah. and the living room. Yeah, yeah, actually, but you bring, you bring up a, a wonderful point, which is why video, you know, art in video games and video games as an artistic medium is so different than any other form of art because it's not as if, you know, brush technology for painting is changing so drastically that mm -hmm. the techniques you learned 20 years ago are no longer applicable today. It's not as if paint technology has changed or musical composition as much. So the, the changes that happen there happen slowly over time over a much longer expanse. Video games as an artistic medium, we're in this kind of hyper evolution where just as we're coming to grips with the tools to accurately convey what it is we want to say, they're cast aside because there's new opportunity to tell more expensive things. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to go ahead and have you all, since we're talking about the past, I want you to talk a little bit about the future of games. Mm -hmm. However, I'm looking at the time, and we're about 15 minutes uh, away from there. We're 45 minutes past. So I want to make sure that Who's I get to the talk to these guys all the time. <laughs> Who's on the next panel? You guys can wait, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure you have the opportunity to ask questions of this panel. So here's what I would ask. We are streaming this live on the web. So we are going to have microphones. I don't know where the microphones are. Middle. They'll be coming down. Are, in the middle? are they in the middle? I can't yeah, right where there's the break and the um, railing there. Ah. There's one there, there's one Okay, on the so side. if you will queue up behind the microphones and they will kind of... Thank you. Okay, since we have somebody behind the mic over here, why don't we start with you. If you could just uh, say your first name and then who you'd address the question to. Hi, uh, David. On the, on, on the increasingly long supply lines to the, front, to the frontiers of, of programming, you say back in 1850 or something, it was, <laughs> sorry, uh, it was <laughs> six weeks and you're in. Now, um, um, about five years ago, it might have been two years. 
now it's six years and, and it now it's six years and you just might need a PhD to be able to get a good job. <laughs> is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this a, is this a necessary thing? I, I, I'll, I'll leap on in that first if I may, because yeah. actually the story he told, you know, it makes a fun joke, but I'm, I'm the guy who made the decision to hire Andy. Um, <laughs> the, the guy I interviewed was a brilliant musician who, although he had come through, he had actually been more than six weeks, um, he had worked really hard, he'd been working full time and then worked school in addition to that, and he passed a tough test in it, and I believed he could do it, and he proved, later he proved that he could. Well, now one thing Mike Minkoff used to say, you know, in hiring somebody and giving them the benefit of the doubt, is it's easier to teach somebody programming skills than to teach them to be creative. Yeah. So if a person's creative and they look like they could learn something there, yeah. hire them. So I think, if I look at it now, have, having hired hundreds of people over, over the years now in different teams, I don't believe that the discouraging stories of well, you have to have uh, studied 17 years of quantum physics, and then uh, once Stephen Hawking is jealous of your <laughs> master's thesis, you know, the fact is, what I think the most critical thing is, is, there's two things. Number one, you'd better love this because it's so much work to get in, and it's so much work to stay in once you do it, that you'd better love it. But if it is what makes you get up in the morning, if it's what inspires you, brings you to life, makes you breathe, then it's merely a matter of saying, okay, what is the path by which I climb up the mountain to be able to do this for a living? And whatever are the discouraging things along the way, you have to dust yourself off and keep going. Um, the idea that it is impossible to get in now or whatever else, I reject. Mm -hmm. I absolutely don't believe that. And I make hiring decisions, and guys here and guys down here make hiring decisions all the time that prove that that's not true. You so. can check in every any time you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful. Be careful. Nice. Don't do it. <laughs> thank you. Thank Banking. you. Thank <laughs> Five in the morning, eating cold pizza. We have the program. next question over here. All right, uh, this is mostly for for Don and Keith, but really, I'd encourage everyone to answer if possible. Please um, don't encourage them. <laughs> <laughs> We're. Throughout the panel, you've been talking a lot about how you started developing games in an era where games were not being developed right. largely at first. So not so much how you got to developing them, but what was the inspiration as to why? What point in, in the 1970s when this was all starting did you go, games should be able to be played on computers in mm -hmm. the home? And because and it just, the start of the industry was like at that, that main point. So how did you, what brought you to that, to that decision? I was a playwriting major. They showed me words interacting, and I wanted to do that. Then they gave me pictures. Okay, I can go do that. They kept creating new boxes. I just wanted to go be on the next box. So for me, it was very simple. New technology came along. Oh, boy. That's the real answer. <laughs> and I came from doing special effects in the film industry and television. Has anybody seen the Star Wars holiday special of 1978? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The blue screen matting in that? Wow. <laughs> that was me. It was full of Ewoks. Wasn't it? Was that? It was full of Ewoks, wasn't it? No, yeah, yeah. No wonder you Itchy and lumpy. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was the. the, the um, so, Ren, what was it for you? No, I, it was it was that uh, Lunar Lander game. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get into it. I, I, I knew I I drew pictures of computers. I didn't know what they were, you know, as a kid. <laughs> but I I actually. Uh, stole time at the, at the university. I, I didn't get in the real way. They wouldn't let me do it either, so I went in the trash can and pulled out lots of that reams of paper that people forgot about the no echo button, and their password would just print, and so I'd steal it. And, um, so through, through junior high, I had all the computer time I wanted. Uh, uh, lived a, across from the university, and Lunar Lander, I played one game, and it was like, that's it. I, you know, and from there, it, it was evolution. It was like, well, what can I make it do now? I remember writing a game in high school called Swarms, mm -hmm. about you know, killer bees in America and all this stuff. And, uh, but it was text and a little map. But it was all evolutionary. Something inspired me. And those seeds are amazing when they grow. You know? So get inspired. If, you yeah. know. Well, well, that, one very quick story, if I may, is because I was in the room when your big break happened, as we talked about. The, a lot of people, and this goes back to the point about not being discouraged. They had done a small game on the Macintosh called The Manhole. Um, yeah. 
not w well known. The Macintosh market was small and everything. And Doug Carlston, who was the president of Broderbund, had seen it, liked it, and thought it was promising. He walked into our publishing meeting. I was running the entertainment and education division at the time. And he walked in and said, I've seen this great game. I'd like to contact these guys. I think we should do something with them. Out of that little game ultimately came Myst because it got noticed. So in terms of, if you think about the indie community now, about not being discouraged about getting into games and doing games, it's another great story. And I had the privilege of being an eyewitness to that moment when it all began for you. So. Yeah, yeah. Stuff yeah, I, mean, I didn't know until Yeah, there. I mean, to that point, you know, anybody out here that is an aspiring game developer and think that it's difficult, you are living in a time where the democratization of technologies, mm -hmm. of tools, of access to information is the most abundant in human history. There are tools out there that are freely available to you and communities that can help you get going. Harness them, be, you know, participate in them, ask questions. That's how you're going to get into this. Anyone that's played Minecraft can see what can happen mm -hmm. when one or two people with an inspired notion, decide to go bring it you know, to the raw and open internet. And, you know, and, and be prepared to, to fail a lot first. Of course. Yeah. Well, you you see, learn yeah. from that. Actually, I'll yeah. leave you with that. Uh, because Notch, who I've known actually for a decade as Marcus, um, he, I first got to him through a, a forum that I started running 12 years ago, javagaming.org. I've watched Marcus develop for a decade. I've watched his 4K games. I've watched him build web games for other companies. And so people go, wow, this guy just did this thing, came completely out of left field. No, he applied himself. He harnessed the community. He harnessed his idea. He honed his craft. And what he's delivered to the platform, to the world rather, actually sits as one of the 80 games in the exhibition. It's a testament to his creativity and wanting to explore this. So, all well, right. I'd say even when we started Mattel, we did have, you know, there are arcade, arcade games were out there. So we did have something to build upon. Because you go play Donkey Kong and say, boy, that's great, and you play these games a lot, and you go, but if I were designing a game, I would do this. And then we had a chance to do that. So right. you, could, you could play games, and it's like, um, I know uh, uh, Dave Warhol, who did uh, Mindstrike, he played a board game and said, boy, if I could have the element of time that I could put in this, and he developed the, you know, Mindstrike. It's a great yeah. strategy game that relies on you doing things quickly. Uh, so it's just yeah. you come to with these ideas uh, yeah. just built upon other people, other, other games, other, you know, yeah. the arcade games and everything. All right, I promise to be quiet. Okay. Go ahead, you, my sir. Question, my question's for the whole uh, panel there. Uh, I spent a lot of hours playing Nintendo games and stuff and always get frustrated when I couldn't save and I had another appointment or something I had to go. When did the idea or what allowed for safe states to be created and stuff? Was it a technology, technology uh, an issue with technology not being advanced enough in the beginning or just nobody had thought of that? I'd, I'd probably say price was actually the biggest yep. issue because it was, you were able to do that even way back in the Atari and television mm -hmm. days. Yep. It was just a matter of how much it cost to put a battery in there and the circuitry mm -hmm. to support it. Yep. So a lot of times, that's why you would see those pass codes you'd have to yeah. put in that were like 40 <laughs> characters long. That was our way of like, okay, well, right. we can't afford a battery. Let's at least give them a pass, password they can put in. Um, I remember trying to save right. seasons of football with like eight <laughs> characters mm -hmm. and like their stats and everything like that. And you can do it, uh -huh. but uh, it was frustrating for people. If I can point one thing out though, is that there was the crash in 1983 and all the games, you know, the game consoles went away. But uh, the desire to play the games and the desire to program the games for us didn't go away. And so a lot of that became computer games. And then once you were on computers, there were features there like of saving games and there were and longer games and everything. And I think that then when the consoles came back, some of those features that were introduced after the crash from computers then found their way back into console yeah. games. Yeah. Great, thank you for the question. Yes. All right, my name is Nick. I'm from Street Pass Princeton, part of the Street Pass group, like Street Pass Network. So my question has to do with like creativity in games. And I think it's great, you know, game developers, they make games, but sometimes I wonder when the uh, game developer makes a very small objective where there's not a whole lot to do, but uh, I can think back to my favorite episode of Icons on G4 when it was good. <laughs> when uh, Will Wright had more fun actually creating the game instead of actually uh, built like having a set objective, like with SimCity, The Sims. So my question is for you uh, in terms of games is where do you think the uh, creativity lies in the gamer in terms of playing the games like Scribblenauts or or even future games that you might come out with. Also, one more thing, should do Pushmo QR codes for Smithsonian Museum. Just a hint. <laughs> Thank you. 
So where does the part of uh, where does the part of the creativity of the player come into the experience that they actually enjoy? Well, I think part of it is that when you if you're creating a game like that, if I think if I think back to uh, all of Will's games are great examples. We did adventure construction set. When you do a game that creates the opportunity for the player to build something, the most satisfying thing I find as a designer is you give up control because the player always does things. Every, yeah. every tool you ever create, every tool you ever released, the player ends up doing things you didn't <laughs> expect. Mm -hmm. That happens on a daily basis when we're making games internally. Our, our own team, when they, we give them the tools, yeah. I'm blown away all the time when they come back and I'm just like, how did you do that? And it's because they actually found a way to use your tool to do something you never expected. As an engineer, particularly when I was doing engineering, I was always surprised by that. And I, I got into games because I had more fun making games mm -hmm. than that. I remember playing Raid on Bungling Bay, which was Will Wright's yeah. game, and like, I was so impressed with all the things going on on that island, and apparently so was he. Yeah. <laughs> the origin for SimCity. Right? But what yeah. you said about the, um, you know, tools and people not expecting things, you know, doing things you didn't expect. That's really the story of computers themselves. Yep. I right. mean, when they in introduced computers, they were saying, you know, well, what's it good for? And IBM was saying like, well, you can store your recipes on here and then you can figure <laughs> out if you've got four people coming over instead of the recipe calls for two, it'll tell you how much ingredients you need. Well, this like, is the type of thing they thought in computers would be used for. The, the public, the people who used it, Matt wound up telling IBM, what the computer's gonna be used for. <laughs> but all the games I'm working on right now are we're allocating server space for user-generated content. And that's things from uh, the world experiences that they're mm -hmm. creating themselves. Uh, games, even one of the things we're working on internally right now is giving the power to create games in a simple way to the user and incorporate it within the game world. Yep. Uh, these are things or concepts that have been around since, uh, since like multi-user dungeons and universities. Uh, that you get to wizard level and then you can create more of the world. That's right. Those kind of things are all coming back right now. So I'm, I'm excited for the next few years here to see what's going to happen. That's what the next panel is all about too. That's right. <laughs> what, I think, I'm sorry, let's get to okay. this young man over here. <laughs> testing, testing. Okay, can you hear me? All right, we got you. Um, so yeah, I got two quick questions. Um, one, since you are all in industry veterans, and especially for Pioneers. Don. <laughs> especially yeah, well, Don? Especially for Don. Did you say especially Don? Yeah, especially Don, <laughs> since he's well, been Oldest. everything so far. Um, <laughs> do you guys have any like uh, E3 anecdotes or something? Like Ooh. trade show anecdotes or something like that? Who told you to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an anecdote where I tried to ruin the industry. There, there are a few good things I've, I've been able to do in life. I, I was the one who actually signed the original distribution deal for SimCity with Will Wright, which was a, a nice moment. But I tried to destroy things once because at the 1981 West Coast Computer Fair, uh, a young man named Richard Garriott, <laughs> alias Lord British, was there. And I tried to persuade him to give up this crazy Ultima stuff and come work for Intellivision. <laughs> and fortunately, Richard decided not to follow the path of evil that I was trying to lead him on. And industry shows are just a haze to me, so I can't remember <laughs> anything. <laughs> well, we well, could, as he, yeah. when you said West Coast, that's the thing, is E3 has only been around for, what, 12 years, 15 years, something like that? Uh, there used to be the Consumer Electronics Show, the yeah. CES, and there was one in January, and there was one in June. And the June one was in Chicago. And so at the time of Intellivision, we would go back to the June one, and, uh, and there was the January one in Las Vegas. And uh, that was one thing that uh, John Soule, who did Astro Smash, always talks about, is that for the time he was at Mattel, every New Year's Eve, every Christmas Eve, he was at the office working in order for getting things to the January CES, which was like the first weekend out of January. So you were working over the Christmas holidays on your game, because this game's got to be shown to the press and the public. And yeah. my second question is, you guys worked on like every generation, but was there ever a console where when it was released, you were like, this console's doomed to fail. It's got no marketing support, no good launch titles. <laughs> it, it just, like for example, the Atari Jaguar would be a perfect example. <laughs> yes, <laughs> actually, I, I'll this, tell you what, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> ah. he's, better, he's better than most game journalists. I know. <laughs> Somebody needs to get him in touch with Chris at Wired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that guy. First of all, E3 is as good as you think it is, so get your parents to take you. It's true. Um, <laughs> secondly, I have one. It's called the Adventure Vision. 
And I owned one that we lost in a move. And I am a very sad panda. As a <laughs> <laughs> so like what, is it like, is there any, the question was like. The, a, the question was, is there any console that you saw that was released you just went, why would they be doing that? Uh, you know, <laughs> successful console I've done that for, and I regret the Wii. I'm like, why? Why would anybody want to do it? And it's like, oh. <laughs> um, and 3DS, I was actually kind of like, mm, I don't know, I don't know. And then now I play it all the time. So, I mean, and, and when you're doing this for, for, for a living, uh, you need to be better than that. <laughs> we'll focus on this other platform that's going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> The platform is not really as important as the games. Yeah. The killer right. app is the game. Uh, you know, a lot of systems have come out, the Sega Dreamcast. Yeah. I thought that was great. That had features that I would have loved yeah, you know, to use. Awesome. I would have loved to design for that because you had, you could give individual information on the controller that only that, in, you know, I thought that was terrific. But they never came out with a game that sold yeah. it. Yeah. Look at Game Boy, black and white, versus Atari Lynx or Game Gear at the time, color systems. They had the better games, and that's ultimately what sells the system. Yeah. That's when it. the Atari first came out, um, it didn't do that well. And, uh, and Nolan Bushnell left the company, and the new people who came in, they were going to kill the home division and strictly do arcade games. And then they released Space Invaders, and boom! Yep. Mm -hmm. Space Invaders saved it. On a, right. on a console that was only meant to play Pong and yeah. mm -hmm. combat. That's right. How about, so, how about you, Ray? Well, any, thank any, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> is there anything that surprised you? Oh, there's a platform. lot that surprised me. Uh, <laughs> Any one specific platform that no, surprised I, you, you know, by honestly, success or failure? A lot of this is just not being cocky. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I don't, you can pick your platform and go, that's not going to work, or that one's going to be big and mm -hmm. you know, flip a coin. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's as much about the failure as the success. Just try and learn from what you did wrong and move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, I think, just don't try and guess what's going to be a success. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's very analogous to not every artist who creates paintings necessarily or work necessarily have them deemed as art by the public. And not every platform that comes out in which to create this art is necessarily up to you. It is up to kind of the desire of the people who right. play these things, right? Who invest their time in it. So I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to go ahead and move outside so you can answer. Yeah, we're absolutely. going to be right, and milling then, about. And didn't they all say that after the second one, there's going to be a longer, we can be back for that for a longer Q&A? Yes. OK. Yes. So, so we'll be around. Right. So we have a half hour break in between the, uh, the two panels, but then everyone will be back to right. an answer for the question, or answer for the question. So yes, <laughs> over here. Hi, my name is Usman. I'm with the Spiral Source and the Montgomery College Advocate. Um, Don, you mentioned that after every new hardware cycle, it's like you know groping around in a dark for a sofa. <laughs> if uh, theoretically hardware cycles were slowed down, do you think that would improve the quality of games, or um, would that you know change anything at all? I think that hardware cycles slowing down improves the part of games that is inspired by mastery of the hardware. <laughs> so being able to push uh, faster frame rates being able to have more refined graphics. I think, Rand, you put it very well earlier, you talking about uh, uh, the fact that sometimes the restrictions we face are the very things that cause us to come up with the most creative answers. And then in a wide open universe, we might not have come up with those ideas. So I think that the, uh, the more time you get on any machine, the more kinds of creative twists you will see and also there's business and economic reasons you have a bigger audience to write for. Mm -hmm. But I think that in general, the thing you always want is some kind of a restriction because that gives you a place to start. It gives you a first handhold on the rock face to decide how you're going to create something unique, something that's just not like what's been done before. Yeah, I think the dynamic of a new game platforms coming out all the time really forces the creativity. What can this system do? Great. I think it's worked out for the best. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so with that, we are going to end the panel. So I'd like to thank Don, Rand, Keith, and Mike. Thanks, guys. Uh, 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 one one. Uh, Woo! There you go. All right. <laughs> And so I guess we're going to take a bit of a break, and then we're going to reconvene for this next panel. I believe people uh, can stay if they want. Um, I guess you guys will be available up front if people have further questions for a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. great. Thank you all.